This week, we interview Chris Roberts on Hacking the Not-So-Friendly Skies. Tenable Sean Mitchell gives us some career advice. And we may have another WordPress vulnerability, or five, to talk about in our Stories of the Week. All that and more on this edition of Security Weekly. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails. They flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. Brought to you by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean pen testing machine. For all those hard to reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com and by Onapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at Onapsis.com. It's now time to fire up a packet capture and pour yourself a beer. Give the intern control of your, well, botnet. Because here's your host. He's a man who loves to do favors that are big and easy, just like your penis. Paul Asadorian. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Security Weekly. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. This is episode 417 for... Thursday. Actually, you're Will Smith. May 7th. You're Will Smith. 2015. Apparently, I'm Will Smith tonight. <laughs> good looking dude. <laughs> he is. He's, he's talking to robots. Yep. Or yes. Your ears are not big enough. <laughs> Speaking of robots, Mr. Joff Thayer's on the line. G'day, Paul. How Welcome are you? G'day, Joff. Larry. To the show. Good to be here again. As usual, I've got my, I don't know, Security Weekly shirt on or something. Something. Island and... Nice. Beer in hand. You know. Well, I'm glad you could join us this evening, uh, Mr. Chop. I think Chop's breathing all those battery fumes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, they're HEM. <laughs> Couple of quick announcements. Ready to learn combat firmware analysis. Wait, wait what am I, Chop Liver? Oh, did I not introduce you? <laughs> Shit. <laughs> what about Larry? One day we'll get it right. Mr. Larry Pesci one, is here next to me. One day. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Along one, with Will one, Smith. One day, yeah. <laughs> hey, look, there we See, are. See, we got distracted by Will Smith. I mean, he's such we a did. He's sexy very dude. Sexy. Yeah. You know, he's older than Uncle Phil when Uncle Phil was on the show. Really? So Will Smith is older than Uncle Phil. Not now, oh, but right, like right. When, We're right. Uh, when on the show. Yeah. That's scary. Makes you feel old, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, but is he better looking? Yes, well, we'll of see. course. <laughs> of course. Couple of quick announcements. Ready to learn combat firmware analysis? Register for my Black Hat course. Embedded device security assessments for the rest of us. A two-day hosted class at Black Hat Las Vegas. Registration includes breakfast, lunch, and access to the Black Hat briefings, business hall sponsor workshops, sponsor sessions, and Arsenal Talks. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash IOT and register today. You got two more things to register for. The first is besides Boston, which is happening... This weekend, May yeah. 9th, day after tomorrow, you can come to B-Sides Boston. Uh, you can see me talk. You can buy Hack Naked shirts, so make sure you do that. Later on, on May 25th through the 28th, is Source Boston. That's right, Source Conference is coming to Boston. I'll be speaking there as well on a different topic, actually. And we'll also be selling Hack Naked shirts. So we're going to make a couple trips up to Boston. It's going to be fun. Make sure that you register. I'd like to introduce <coughs> our very special guest for this evening, Chris Roberts, who's regarded as one of the world's foremost experts on counter-threat intelligence within the cybersecurity industry. Yeah. Roberts constructs and directs One World Labs' comprehensive portfolio of cyber defense services designed to improve the physical and digital security posture of both its enterprise and government clients. Roberts understands enterprise security requirements, having served as both an in-house security expert and consultant on IT security engineering and architecture design operations for scores of Fortune 500 companies. He regularly engages with various government agencies on critical security issues of national importance. Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. Thanks for having me on. Yes. Yeah, so, <clears throat> Chris, how did you get your start in information security? Ooh, uh, back when I was about 15, 16 years old. Uh, the upside is I had a couple of computers I was running, and the downside is I watched uh, the War Games movie. Mm. I could, uh, <laughs> actually have to war drive once. I could actually put it all in a nice long file, and it would uh, auto-dial for me. At which point, uh, a nice bank in England and I became friends with each other. <laughs> Very nice. Friends. 
Yeah. Friends. <laughs> so, Chris, what ha- you, there were some headlines lately. What happened when you were on an airplane? So what happened, the first thing that happened was I was very civilized and actually paid for my wireless on the airplane for a nice change, thankfully, which uh, I have a receipt for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, somebody sent me the GAO report. I was actually going from uh, Denver to Chicago and then on to Syracuse to a, an aviation security conference. I got partway through the flight to, uh, to to Chicago. Somebody sent me the GAO report that says, you know, airlines are vulnerable, at which point I looked at uh, something that Airbus had put out, and Airbus was like, oh, no, we're perfectly safe, everything's wonderful, and I called bullshit on it and did it in a pretty blunt and pretty, uh, pretty neat 140 characters and said I'm sitting in front of a, a, a system and I know damn well I can get into it. And uh, that apparently caused some, uh, some issues. So did you actually plug into something under your seat? No, no, I did not. I okay. was uh, I was pretty blunt on the, hey, you know, I know this is what can be done. But no, thankfully, because my understanding is they pulled the airplane aside, they've looked at it, they've interviewed passengers and all sorts of good things. I gotcha. Jeez. So is yeah. there something you could plug into under your seat or you, you don't know? Oh, yeah, no, there definitely is. There's a, a nice control box under the seat that has a, a modified uh, Cat 5, Cat 6 jack under it to make friends with the in-flight entertainment system. I see. Huh. But that's the in-flight entertainment system. That should have nothing to do with the airplane controls, correct? You would hope and you would think. <laughs> <laughs> and that would be logic. But unfortunately, logic does not appear to have been part of the design criteria. Um, it's, uh, in-flight entertainment has two avenues from there. It goes to the, uh, the, copy control, uh, the cabin control systems, I'm sorry, and then also goes out to the uh, satellite systems. So you've got two attack avenues from there. And obviously, cabin control systems and SATCOM systems have discrete network access into the avionics systems and the uh, pilot avionics stuff. And I've heard this for quite some time that, you know, kind of rumblings from people that the systems on board an airplane are not, in fact, separate. Well, what's kind of lagged the change and prevented things from actually getting better and more secure? I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's a couple of things. One, they're using a whole bunch of like the off-the-shelf, the COTS stuff. So they're using a lot of the off-the-shelf stuff. Secondly, there's all the interconnects. You look at what the pilots are using up front. They, especially in the more modern jets, have got a lot of the glass cockpit systems. So they are now, obviously, you've got the iPad issues in, uh, I think. Yes. Yeah. The, you have had the iPad issues. Like, that's the iPad connecting to the data that they need, which is sitting behind the systems. Um You've got the cabin control systems, which are, you know, the cockpit front end system has, the back end system has. You've just got a complex ass all about face network that everybody's running around on. Mm-hmm. Chris, how did you come to learn about uh, the systems that are on various uh, airplanes? There's a lot of just researching, or have you conducted uh, tests for various airlines or airplane manufacturers? So we have tried to engage with both the airline manufacturers and a bunch of the number of the airlines and haven't had a huge amount of success. Uh, one of our Intel guys found a release from Boeing from a couple of years ago where I think Render, myself, Raoul, and a few others were considered uh, potential threats to uh, to Boeing. Um, Airbus has kept on telling us that we, they'd want some help over in uh, Toulouse and various other places, and it's never come to anything. But for me, it was I was messing around with the, the vehicles. Uh, Jesse and I were messing around with cars and everything else and started to look at the IntelliBus stuff. Intellibus is a Boeing thing, and so we switched our attention to airplanes and then pretty much so turned all the research tools that we have against airplanes to see what we could find out. <clears throat> to your knowledge, has there ever been an attack on the computer systems of an airplane for the, with malicious intent? Ooh, uh, there have been a lot of potential issues on airplanes that have been attributed to attacks, but no, to my knowledge, there's never been one direct attack against one. There's been a lot of work that's been done to see what we can do to them, but there's never been an attack against one. Hmm. Did you consult with CSI Cyber when they did their episode <laughs> where all of the Wi-Fi went out on the planes? <laughs> I just watched that one the other day. <laughs> did you? So I found that one out. Uh, that was brilliant. No, um, uh, I did not. Somebody gave me the heads up that they were doing one, and then eventually it turned up, what, a week or two after all the shenanigans happened. Yeah, it was brilliant timing. Yeah. I mean, the, obviously, what they portrayed on the show is completely infeasible. Well, it, in my it, it, no, it had, it, had, well, it had some basis in fact. Some. Some basis that's in fact. The, I mean, that's the crux of that show is yep. some basis uh, in uh, fact, but yep. yes. it's exaggerated oh. for TV. Right, absolutely exaggerated. And all of the attacks are based in, from, from what I've observed, have been based in some sort of reasonable 
technical stuff. I mean, the, right. all they they mentioned that they had all of these the the phones making different connections to the the onboard Wi-Fi, which crashed it, which is absolutely possible. Absolutely. Oh yeah, that's that's fairly easy to do. You can do that with a Pony Express for crying out loud. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And a pineapple, a well-placed pineapple on board an airplane is much fun to be had. Not that I would know anything about that. Theoretically, it's right. what I've heard. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Exa- exactly. I mean, um, yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, what are your technological uh, recommendations for airlines to prevent some of these issues? I, I think there's a couple of things. I mean, number one, I mean, the work that we've done, the research that we've done, number one, to be like, hey, actually pay attention and fix it. Number two, the guys over at IOActive have done a really nice paper on the SATCOM systems. Again, read the damn thing and actually take some of the considerations. But part of it is let put more controls. I mean, put more separation. Part of the issues and part of the reason why it's so flipping easy is you look at the servers that are serving the, uh, the in-flight entertainment as well as the cabin control systems, it's embedded architecture that because of how FAA doesn't allow rapid upgrades, I mean, it's sitting way behind the curve. Hmm. So one, change that process somehow. Or the number two, put better separation in place. And number three, the little box underneath the seat, you might want to protect that a little bit better or make the whole thing, you know, not quite so hardwired in. Is that little box underneath every seat as part of the in-flight entertainment system? Uh, it's underneath every row. So if you have a uh, an in-flight entertainment console in front of you, in other words, embedded in the headrest of the seat mm-hmm. in front, the chances are if you dig around underneath, you'll find the cables that lead down to a nice little box. And if it's got power and it's got the in-flight entertainment, it's got some fun little cables in there. Not that I would advocate anybody messes around too much at the moment. <laughs> yes. They're a little sensitive at the moment. <laughs> I bet. Uh, yes. I bet. So did they? So you made this tweet when you were on the airplane. Yeah. And so what happened? When, did something happen during flight, or did it, were you landed? No. Like what happened? Landed in Chicago, no issues. Got onto the plane to Syracuse, no issues. Landed in Syracuse. Uh, plate pulled up to the gate. Um, everybody got up and rummaged around to get off, and everybody was told to sit there. Sorry, ass down. So we all were civilized and sat back down again. Then uh, two uniformed Syracuse officers came on board and started walking up the aisle. And then uh, two uh, FBI agents came on. I mean, you can tell they're FBI for crying out loud. Mm-hmm. Those guys came on. Um, they clean, stopped- clean cut looking, wearing suits, right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Apparently one of them got out of bed and, and was crawled out of bed to go make friends with me. And the other one was, uh, yeah, they, they, they stand out like a sort of bloody thumb. And so, so they came up and came- said, Mr. Roberts, come with me. Well, they were not. They actually walked past me. I think they must have thought I was sitting in a different seat. Turned around, and I just looked up, and I'm like, "All right, my my oh shit meter just went through the roof." I'm just like, uh, "Shall I get my bags now?" And they're like, "Ah, Mr. Roberts." Yeah, <laughs> oh, please. there you are. <laughs> yeah. So uh, so went off and had a, a four hour discussion with them. Interesting. And then obviously they let you go. Yeah, they let me go. They kept all my toys. Uh, they kept my laptop, my iPad, um, multi terabytes worth of hard drives, a bunch of USB drives. They took my Think Geek and Neutron, and I um, was very upset with that. I hope they plugged it in somewhere. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> so freaking hope so. Yes, um, yes. They got a couple of USB drives that have got some zero days in, so I'm, I'm looking forward to those calling home one day. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, 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 and you know, I and and for me that from from what I I've read that there were you know lots of people took your tweet as a threat, and and quite honestly, yeah. I did not. I saw that as hey, I happen to be sitting here, and wow, all these funny things could happen because I know they can happen, but I haven't actually done anything, and I never intend to do anything. That's that's what I read into that tweet. So I, I think maybe some things got a little bit overblown. And the fact I, that and the fact that you deal with all those folks on a fairly regular basis gives more credibility to that, in my mind. That was the whole thing about it. And actually, um, I got my hands on the affidavit that was put together to get the warrant that turned up two days after the uh, seizure. And the uh, the affidavit actually stipulated that United were the ones that notified the FBI. It wasn't even the FBI watching for a change. It was actually United notified the FBI. So, Jeez. yeah. Intrigued as to that one. I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure why I was on United's radar. Uh, I can understand being on, obviously, Boeing and Airbuses, but United was a bit of a surprise for me. That's that's really bizarre. Yeah. Mm. Um, any, anything else you want to say about the whole... So, so where, where are you now with the whole investigation? Uh, 
so EFF obviously have done an amazing job there. They're keeping an eye on things for me. Um, they and a third-party legal firm have reached out to the FBI Justice Department just to see what the plans are. My understanding is the equipment left Syracuse, it's back in Denver, um, and I'm assuming it's in queue. So that's that's all ongoing. I mean, I, my, the logic would assume that if I was that bad of a problem or that much of a threat, number one, I wouldn't be wandering around the streets. Number two, they would have come asking for my encryption passwords by now. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I mean, that's that's one side of it. And obviously, you know, dealing with all the repercussions inside uh, OWL at the board level at the moment. Right, right. Um. All right. So we're done with that topic for now. How's that? For now. I like that. For now. (laughs) For now. So tell us about uh, threat intelligence. I think that's a term that's really misunderstood. Oh. uh, People think different things of that term. Chris, how do you you define it? So we tend to define it fairly differently. Uh, We have – so we've got a team of analysts – Um, Good guys. Most of them come out of the Intel community. We've obviously got a couple of well-known people inside our community as well that are doing it. We're pulling in data. So we have our own feeds. We've built our own systems. We have our own Tor architecture, and we have our own proxy systems. We've got about 25,000 proxy systems and about four or 500 Tor nodes. We pull in about 20 to 25 million targets every single day. Um, IRC channel, I2P channel, darknet stuff, pastebin stuff, wherever it might be. And then we are taking a look at the data on it. We're basically looking at it from a contextualization standpoint, natural language standpoint. We've got 33 different languages that we're doing the reviews on, and we're looking to talk and work with our clients to help them understand what the issues are. In other words, if somebody's actually looking to attack them, if somebody's talking about them, if they've lost stuff already, vendors or partners have actually had issues with them. Basically, we're trying to look at everything outside of their bloody four walls and their firewalls. Interesting. Interesting. How, how can organizations today use, effectively use threat intelligence? I think the biggest thing is, is, well, there's a couple of things. So you know as well as I do, half the time an organization finds out it's been breached about six months after they've actually been breached. You know, somebody tells them, well, they eventually figure it out, or somebody calls them and says, hi, we're the FBI. Um, we've been watching your systems. You've been breached. Have a nice day. Um, the whole idea is, worst case scenario, if they've been breached, to be able to actually tighten that timeline down. In other words, we see their data being sold, now you can notify them. Uh, number two is, I think, the big one as well, as you know as well as I do, uh, security budgets. It's a challenge sometimes to get them. If you can turn around to an organization's leadership and say, hey, you don't need to go by the new blinky red firewall with the nice blue light. You actually need to spend more money on educating your employees, spend more money on you know, focusing on the vendors and partners and have the actual evidence to back that up, that's a huge help for an organization. Chris, what about indicators of compromise or IOCs? Is I, I hear that term a lot in the vendor space. Yeah. But what does that really mean to someone like you who spends a lot of time in this space? To us, it's, I mean, uh, for us, we, I don't, I hope we haven't got any of that bloody stupid stuff out on our side of things, but for us, <laughs> it's... <laughs> For us, it's a case of, yeah, perfect example would be an organization we're doing some work with, a healthcare organization. We found some of the data out there. I mean, it's like, hey, you have lost data, tracking that data down, figuring out it was actually a vendor and a partner that they'd handed research data off to who'd managed to lose the damn stuff. To us, that's the indicator. Another option is for us as well, if their internal IT guys have released internal codes, I mean, perfect example, somebody drops the config of the Cisco, drops it onto the Cisco uh, forums, but they don't redact it. So now you've got the entire, you know, enable password sitting out there on a bloody forum that anybody can get access to. Last I checked, we have a several hundred thousand of those in the damn database. Mm-hmm. So it's, and then if you are able to track that and say, hey, that Cisco forum is being watched by threat actors in Korea or China or wherever it is. And by the way, now we've just found it on an IRC forum. You can now help an organization understand, you know, hey, you're going to get taken out and here's how and here's why. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Um, what else do you want to talk about, Chris? I feel like we went really fast through all those topics, dude. I know. We Time did. flies it's, it's, when we it's, talk it's to you. It's just like with women. It's, it really goes really fast. Uh, <laughs> I went. Especially. I feel like we've met before, like, at DEF CON. A uh, number of times yeah. at DEF CON. Yes. A yes. number of times at DEF CON and various other places, yeah. So are you speaking at any upcoming conferences? 
Uh, I found out two days ago, apparently I'm speaking at B-Sides in Denver. Um, nice. I talked at RSA, and um, Nikita and I are going back and forth. We're talking about, I'm doing a, a mens- I put in a talk, two talks actually for RSA. One of them is uh, the whole Internet of Things. We had an absolute riot with the Internet of Things. Mm-hmm. And then the other one is, you know, I, I come and almost want to do one, a funny thing happened on the way to the airport type of talk. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, learn, from yeah my, learn from my mistakes and theirs. Yeah, that pretty much yeah. How 140 characters can really get you yelled at pretty badly. So, uh, tell me about the Internet of Things. Are you involved with the Internet of Things Village, or do you have other talks no, on the Internet I, of Things? I'm, I'm actually not. I, in fact, I probably should get my ass and, and do that. I'm not gooning this year, so I'm actually taking a break from gooning at DEF CON. Um, so, I'm probably going to have some time on my hands. I actually want to go back and do the scavenge hunt, but if there's an Internet of Things Village... I'll come play because the presentation we gave uh, at a couple of conferences now, we started off with somebody's oven, one of these nice, expensive decor IQ ovens. Uh-huh. Um, we took the Android system out completely, uh, dropped a thing on now, it. Hold on. Wait, Chris, back up. So what does the Android system do on the oven? I actually it's haven't that, seen it's, it's the really, oven. Like, what's the, if I were to use it as a consumer, like what, what can I expect for features? Yeah, you can be driving home or leaving the office and remotely connect to your oven and basically turn your food on, turn it off. If you're going to be late, you can turn it up, you can turn it down, you can pre-program it, you can preheat it. You do all sorts of fun things. So that's an embedded device in your oven that I'm assuming connects to your home Wi-Fi. And does it connect to the internet and then go to their cloud and then you use an app on your phone that connects to their cloud? Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah, so at that point in time, all you got to do is sit in the middle between the application itself, the application owner who's sitting there in you know Starbucks with his coffee shop, yeah, and take his OAuth level one authentication token and a couple of other criteria. And at that point in time, you're making friends with his oven, right? Mm-hmm. Right. You know, That's a you, lot. Of, you know, Veracode highlighted a lot of those things too. Now, yeah. in in some way though, I kind of feel like that is almost safer than just giving the consumer the device and saying, oh, by the way, if you want to manage this thing remotely, you've got to poke a hole in your firewall. Oh, no, UPnP will do that. Yeah, for and you. the UPnP does it for you, right? So, I mean, that's <laughs> scary. But yeah. So when we go to the whole, like, blending of embedded device, mobile, cloud, I feel like we have a better chance of doing security, but people still freaking get it wrong. Oh, totally. Well, you look at the embedded device in the oven that we hit. It was like on Android 403 or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it was just, it was a game at that point. I had my emulator working. I had uh, the OAuth authentication on the emulator making friends with their oven. I dropped command line onto the oven. I dropped thing onto the oven and scanned the network. And we started making friends with Wemos and Nests mm-hmm. and all sorts well, of yeah, stuff. Well, yeah, because someone I, I, I like, that, I like if you've how got he, a like, smart oven, you probably yeah. have those other devices yeah, and, too. And, and yeah. I like how he puts it. They make friends with. Make friends with. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a friendly thing. It's like we're like friends that dry hump almost. Yeah. Well, <laughs> what? Well, isn't that speak what for yourself? Is? I went home. <laughs> isn't that what networking is by definition? <laughs> for friends that dry. Hump. Yeah. Well, you first usually at first it's dry, and then maybe. Yeah, you did. Sometimes if you do it long enough, it gets wet. But it's usually only in my pants. Right? Sorry, Chris. What were we talking about? <laughs> Something about ovens. That dry hump. You were dry humping someone's oven. I think is where you were. Yeah, I, we lost it. We're somewhere. <laughs> I think we were, we were doing poltergeist with their TV at like three o'clock in the morning. That's awesome. That was well. That was on CSI Cyber too about the whole house oh, that no, just goes haywire. Yeah, was that CSI yeah, yeah, Cyber yeah, where they set the printer on fire remotely? Yep. Yep, they overheat the oh, laser printer. Electrics. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure that there's physical. I'm like ninety nine point nine percent positive. The last I researched, it was that there are actually physical barriers that you can't overheat the printer remotely. Yeah, using no, firmware. we with the Wemos. We had that. This uh, the the our uh, friendly target had uh, a bunch of the Wemos hooked up to his coffee machine, his television, and a bunch of other things. Yeah. And he had a Nest, so we, we, we made friends with a Nest. And his Nest was hooked up to the power grid, the smart grid system. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we, we, we messed with that fairly extensively. That's awesome. Click, 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 click. Well, yeah, Nest is fully programmable. Oh, yeah. so. oh, that thing's a hoot. And the way they've now hooked him up, so the, uh, several of the, I think it's like eight or ten of the states, you can actually, I don't know if they're giving incentives, but your Nest can now hook up to the main, you know, provider of electricity and system. Yep. At which they have the ability to override controls and everything. Well, that's great if the bloody thing was secured properly. But it's got some challenges. And again, we're back to OAuth authentication. We're back to reverse engineering the code. We're back to the fact that most of the source code is sitting out flipping GitHub and JetBrain, at which point you do your research. 
Now I can go make friends with the back end servers, at which point I can, I've got a nice screenshot of everybody else's Wemo, uh, everybody else's nests hooked up to this damn one server that we were sitting on. Mm. That's interesting. That's interesting. So, you know, at that point in time, it's like, um, yeah, who wants to be, you know, yeah, do we take you all down to 58 or do we drop you all up to 86? You know, take your pick from that. Yeah. yeah, and depending on how many you have, how many do you want to turn all at the same time? Oh, yeah. Because that becomes, that becomes a real problem from an energy consumption perspective. Huge issue. So, yeah, we were um, we starting to mess with that stuff. That, uh, yeah, it was the, the Internet of Things stuff is, is phenomenal, how many avenues and how many different ways there are of dissecting that one. It's going to be... Uh, <sighs> I mean, the ironic stuff of the whole plane thing is I stopped researching planes a year and a half, two years ago, and we moved to the Internet of Things and a few other things that are going to be coming out over the next six months. We, uh, we messed with, uh, I think we we're about to annoy the hell out of Department of Transportation because we're demonstrating how to smuggle Canadians to Mexico. It's <laughs> <laughs> a really long tunnel. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Going to have some fun with that one. Yeah, you know, because you talked about the different avenues in the Internet of Things, and it's, it's so true. And there's so many different ways to attack it. You know, I, I tend to focus on the firmware side of it. Right. But there's the protocol side of it. There's yep. the mobile application side of it. There's the web application side of it. There's so many different facets to it. Yep. And well, I think we've got a long way to go. In fact, I'm pretty positive we have a mm -hmm. long way to go. Before we can securely have all of those conveniences as home, and let's, I mean, let's be honest, as nerds, we love that stuff too, right? I mean, Chris, you'd be lying because you didn't have any of that technology and use at your home, right? Oh, I, I mean, especially when we're doing all the research, I had half a dozen of the bloody Wemos running around this place. We bricked three nests before we finally got the last one right. That gets expensive after a while. Yes, it does. Yes, I'm, yes it does. I'm, yeah. I mean, I'm sitting at my desk and I've got several computers, a bunch, probably 30, 40 terabytes of NAS storage and a bunch of other stuff that gets used for research and playing and messing around and a few other things. And a few other things, huh? Yes, like a couple of bricked nests. <sighs> yeah, that would be the one. That would be the one. Yeah, you know, uh, what's been really fun for me lately is um, the combination threats in the Internet of Things. Um, you know, if, for example, some of the tests I've been on, I've, I've managed to do... Um, uh, do some uh, input input validation issues and in, in, uh, injection in from mobile apps that adversely affect the web apps, and that's yeah. an area that that people are not you know they're not really looking at. They tend to take things in silos. They're looking at the web app and then the mobile app and then the and it's it's sort of fun to see the cross pollination and things that <laughs> that come out of that. I think I mean it's it's that, and when we picked on the the target that we picked on. Uh, we did our. We basically did a whole bunch of OSINT research on a, a fairly well-known dam system in the Pacific Northwest, and we were like, okay, let's pick a target and let's basically do full OSINT research and figured out that this guy, you know, decent electronics background and everything else, and like, okay, we found him. We found him on a bunch of Chinese systems where they've been researching all of the SCADA guys that were working in the specific dam system. We're like, okay, we know we're not the only ones looking at this guy. Damn. So you take a step back and you're like, okay, if I can't get him through his work system because maybe they've got the protections in place, I'll get to him from his home system. And then from his home system, as long as I can drop enough payloads in enough different places, it's going to end up on his work system no matter what. And at that point, it's game over. It's either that or his, work, his home system VPNs into work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's at that I mean. I think the problem is, is organizations are still focused on, hey, my firewall equals my border. My locked door equals my border. Mm -hmm. And aren't looking at the, the crazy proliferation of devices and the data that's just scaping out all over the place. So, Chris, you said yeah. you're speaking next um, at uh, DEF CON, potentially? Besides, besides Dallas. Besides, Dal uh, besides okay. Denver. De besides Denver, yeah. And then I think... Um, I think what I've been told is uh, B-Sides in Vegas. I'm going to be up on stage at B-Sides in Vegas causing chaos as well. And then Nikita's actually got an email to me for the whole Internet of Things. She's like, uh, you need to explain this a little bit more effectively for the board. So I promised I'd get back to her by this evening. So uh, we'll see on that one. And then Render and I are meant to be talking about airplanes. But EFF might turn around and say, for crying out loud, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they kind of they like, they like to do that from yeah. time to time. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I don't think they want to see me taken off in handcuffs again. Uh, did they actually cuff you? No, they were civilized this time. Uh, I got hauled off a plane several years ago up in Canada um, as a. Uh, it wasn't necessarily revenge. It was more uh, a get my own back. We um, 
I was up presenting at a conference in Canada, and they've got that really nice tower with the spinny restaurant on top. Yeah. yeah. The spinny restaurant's controlled by a Windows XP machine. <laughs> <laughs> so did it go it's faster really or slower? Motor, and it's real easy, and you can actually make it turn the other way around. Um, RCMP were not overly amused by that. So uh, we had a lengthy discussion about that, and then they threw me on a plane that went directly to Denver. So they were actually they were totally cool guys about it because they handed everything over and said, "You've got a problem here." But uh, yeah, they pulled me off on one of the planes. So it's not the first time I've made friends with uh, planes and people. All right, well, stop doing that because <laughs> it's not a good trend to have to be hauled up well, in handcuffs. So, Chris. so you know what? I, I, I have got a, I've got a great question. I don't know the the bill, the new bill that President Obama signed in. Ooh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I saw some discussion, and it was over at Arata. I think it was Dave Maynard that was commenting on it. Um, yeah. And that the bill is very sort of vague about what includes sort of authorized access. Y- your thoughts? Yeah. Your thoughts, authorized access or explicit non authorization? <sighs> yeah, it's going to make life a little interesting, especially for the research. I mean, I'm fortunate that I've got either OWL or HHS as a backing to and say, hey, we're, we're legitimately doing this because this is our trade our work and everything else uh, but at the same time you have to be ridiculously careful of what's defined by authorized i'm not overly happy we sat down with the, like the guys from rapid seven and various other places and we've talked to a bunch of the senators and a lot of other people to say hey how do we make sure that we protect the ability for us to continue to do what we're doing mm, yeah because uh, you exactly yeah and actually there's a in, in all fairness um as much fun as we make of the feds so there's a couple of guys uh, that are part of our family. I had a really good uh, talk with Russ, Russ Handoff, a um, sure. couple of days afterwards, and yep. he was. They want to get a bunch of us in a room at DEFCON or somewhere similar and say, "How do we cooperate more effectively?" Now, hopefully that'll happen, and hopefully everybody listens. But I mean, it, it something's got to happen because if we take a step back and say, "Hey, you know what? You guys are on your own. We're not doing research. We're going to go back to our normal day jobs." It's gonna get nasty. I mean, it's already nasty. It's just gonna get a hell of a lot worse. Right, out there. right. Now they're gonna now the the HHS is gonna have to hire their own folks, which are not yeah. gonna pay. They're not gonna be qualified. Right. Exactly. And yeah, we're yeah, you know we're, we're, we're gonna off. we're gonna be that whole thing. We're gonna be behind the Chinese and educating our students in math all over again. Yeah, uh, and it's right. a bloody mess. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we're better off making friends in the good way, yes. not not uh, not getting oppositional. So. Agreed. That would be the preference. And, you know, dry humping tends to make friends, so, Chris, I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> I'll set Gillis on them. I'll go to Gillis, give him a hug. There you well, go. Oh, wow. So, Chris, wow. are wow. you make ready? Sure, make sure he's gone jogging first. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love Gillis. I love Gillis. Oh, yeah. So, Chris, are you ready to play five questions with Security Weekly? Oh, my gosh. Go for it. Three words to describe yourself. Uh, large, hairy thing. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? Uh, ice. A, I, 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 I've always wanted to try and do ice. Just the, the, the ice thing. Icicle, yeah. If there we you, go, icicle. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Oops. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Okay, what? <laughs> that one by Did me you again? want me to repeat the question? In the popular yes. game of Ass Grabby Grabby, do you prefer Ooh. to go first or second? I'm going second on that one, I think. We'll have an interesting one on that one. <laughs> Choose two celebrities to be your parents Gwyneth Paltrow. Um, oh, God, grief. Um, Sean Connery. There you go. Very All nice. Right. Very nice. Just like your mother likes it, Trebek. <laughs> <laughs> that, that makes sure it's on a perverted life. You know. <laughs> guys were talking about that yesterday. That seems Oh, good. wait. They don't have to be married, do they? <laughs> <laughs> nope. No, they do not. Well, you can follow uh, Chris Roberts on Twitter. His handle is SidDragon1 or SIDragon1. Um, and um, wait for more tweets. Wait Epic for ones. more tweets. <laughs> yeah, yeah we'll, we'll try not to be quite as blunt next time in something else that we're messing with. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be pretty hard to top that tweet, though. Mm-hmm. We talked a lot about just that one tweet. So, oh man, did we ever? Yeah, the tweet heard round the airport, uh, the airline industry. <laughs> well, Chris, we look forward to seeing you uh, certainly at uh, DefCon and B sides Las Vegas. So it was very nice having you on the show. Thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. You guys take care. You too. Absolutely. Thanks, good, Chris. Good luck. Well, look, ta-da. 
Yeah, and with cheers. that, we're going to take a short break. Come back, probably make up some cocktails, and bring our next guest on the show, which will be Sean Mitchell talking about some career development and a little bit about all the jobs they have here at Tenable. Sean is great. I, I, know, I know Sean pretty well. Nice. Uh, he's, he's got some great career advice. So with that, we'll take a short break. Come back. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Boop. Boop. 